nature's time bombs. Unpredictable. Unleashing awesome power that can wipe out landscapes and lives in an instant. These are some of the world's most violent disasters. And the only way to stay safe is to stay out of the way. Montserrat, a tiny Caribbean island paradise, just 16.5 kilometers long by 10 wide. And although most don't know it, the island hides a ticking time bomb. Soufriere Hills, a volcanic mountain rising 915 meters above the sea. The good news, it hasn't had a major eruption in centuries. Mother of six, Delia Pond, makes her living farming the rich soil on the mountain slopes. She's a proud islander. It is a paradise. And because everybody is so friendly towards one another, we never have a cave in the world. But in 1995, Montserrat's sleeping giant suddenly wakes with a deafening roar. Over the next two years, islanders endure the volcano's tantrums. It screams bursts of steam and clouds of ash that cover the island. You're awake, you're awake to the ash. You drink water, you're drinking ash. You're eating your food and you're eating ash. To protect the population, the government sets up an exclusion zone. But it covers almost two-thirds of the island, where nearly everyone lives and works. And it covers the farming fields, Delia Pond's only source of income. After years of evacuations, islanders are unsure of the real threat. Stuck between a big fiery rock and a hard place, the farmers have no choice but to tend their fields within the danger zone. Even so, they take precautions. Whenever we get to the farm in the morning, we always turn the vehicle facing towards the, the, the road, and we always leave the keys in the car in case of emergency, so we just get in and take off. So the islanders adapt, and life goes on. until June 25th, 1997, when seismometers jump to life. The island's volcano is building to a climax. It erupts, firing a cloud of ash and steam into the air. Down in the valley, farmers are working in the fields, but the weather's bad and they can't see what's happening on the mountain. Across the island, sirens go off, and an alert of imminent danger is broadcast over local radio stations. Report to all islanders in the south of the island. Activity at Sophia Hills Volcano has... But Delia Pond and her family are among several farmers who don't hear the warning. All people inside the exclusion zone should leave immediately. Suddenly, the volcano ejects an avalanche of superheated gas and rock. It's heading straight for the farmers. In the valley, Delia looks up to the sight of white hot lava bearing down on her. James, we have to go right now. She and her family rush to escape. We must get out of here. A second blast fills the valley with lava. A third monster eruption spews out a tsunami of red-hot rock. 
It spills over the valley walls and races down the mountain at 128 kilometers per hour. Other farmers still in the fields run for a hill, praying to make it to safety. But not everyone will escape. Half a world away, another one of nature's time bombs ticks. This one in the Austrian Alps. At the ski resort of Galtur, the weather is terrible. The area has been pounded with snow for over two weeks. And heavy winds batter the village, screaming in at speeds of 120 kilometers per hour. The ski slopes are closed, and on February 18th, the threat of avalanches shuts down the only road leading into Galtur. 4,000 people are cut off from the outside world. But people in the heart of avalanche country are prepared. Galtur has three color-coded avalanche zones. The high-risk red zone surrounds the village. In the potentially dangerous yellow zone, all houses and hotels are reinforced. The green zone at the heart of the village is considered safe, a place beyond the reach of any avalanche. As long as people stay in the green zone, they should be safe. But high above Galta on Grieskov mountain, the snowpack creaks under its enormous weight. The next moment, a giant snow slab breaks away. A wave of snow hits the outer yellow zone with a force of a 25-ton truck hitting a brick wall at 80 kilometers per hour. It wipes out the supposedly avalanche-proof buildings in an instant. Then it thunders through the village like a tornado blowing away anyone in its path. It finally ends 100 meters inside the so-called safe zone at the center of Galtur. In seconds, the village is decimated. Mangled cars litter the landscape. Buildings in the village weren't made to withstand an avalanche. So as the enormous pressure of snow builds up inside, entire chalets explode. Shocked villagers immediately search for survivors. Working in lines, they probe the snow to locate hidden bodies. No one knows how many are trapped. As darkness falls, the temperature plummets well below freezing. But for those buried beneath the snow, the greatest threat isn't cold, it's asphyxiation. Rescue teams race to pull people out before they suffocate under the snow. North America, April 3rd, 1974. Howling winds and dark clouds converge over America's heartland, AKA Tornado Alley. A massive tornado outbreak is on the way. Back then, meteorologists had radar to detect the first signs of a tornado, but they had no way of predicting exactly where and when they would hit. Often, their warnings were ignored. Severe thunderstorm warning has been changed to a tornado warning. Then in Xenia, Ohio, a tornado touches down and heads straight for the city center. Guess what? There's a tornado! Excited to see the twister, high school teenagers run to the windows. But this is no Wizard of Oz fantasy. It's terrifyingly real. All over Xenia, people run to take cover from the impending tornado.
Meanwhile, on the outskirts of Monticello, Indiana, another monster tornado rips through the countryside. Directly in its path, a camper van carrying a group of schoolgirls home from a trip. As they begin to cross the Tippecanoe River, the twister swoops down. It tosses the van over 15 meters into the river below. It's a memory that continues to haunt Karen Stotts. When the bus went down, I saw two people, my teacher and my friend. I never saw anybody else. I don't know where they were. Karen escapes the van, only to fight ferocious winds as she tries to swim to shore. I had to fight very hard to survive. And I just began swimming as hard as I could. I truly saw my life go right before my eyes, but I somehow, by the grace of God, did not die. So. Karen reaches the riverbank, exhausted but alive and prays for her friend's survival. Nature's fury hits every corner of the globe. But some countries are more vulnerable than others. In 2010, when a magnitude seven quake hits Haiti, the result is catastrophic. 230,000 people die, and over a million are left homeless. But the country is so poor, even if they knew exactly when the quake would strike, they could little afford to do anything about it. Nearly a year after the disaster, over a million Haitians still live in makeshift tent camps without clean water or a proper sewage system. The result, a people left at the mercy of the elements and disease. Other countries, like Japan, know to expect earthquakes and have the wealth to prepare for them. Monday, January 16th, 1995. It's a national holiday in Kobe, Japan's sixth largest city, and one of the world's biggest ports. People hardly notice several small earthquakes during the day. Later that night, Satoshi Shono is at home showing off his new laptop to his mum, Yukiko. We stayed up chatting for quite a while that evening. Then it turned midnight and he said, you should go to bed, Mum. I'll have to stay up until about two. Good night. Early the next morning, the ground moves again. But this is no tremor. Buildings crumble. An elevated expressway sways. It's like driving on waves. A busload of passengers on the verge of falling over the edge is saved when the driver slams on the brakes. But then... I pulled on the handbrake, and at that moment, the road in front of me just fell away. I really thought we'd fallen off the edge. I was paralyzed with fear. At the Osaka Earthquake Observatory, scientists are stunned to find that Kobe is in the grip of a 7.2 magnitude earthquake. It's the first time in four centuries that a massive quake has struck the area. Just 14 seconds after the quake began, it's over. Yoshio Fukumoto's bus teeters on the edge of the shattered freeway. Worried that it'll plunge to the ground, he rushes to evacuate the passengers. Uh. 
Across Kobe, ruptured gas mains fuel fires raging across the city. And broken water mains leave firefighters virtually helpless. Residential areas turn into infernos. Hundreds like Yukiko Shono are trapped in the remains of their traditional wooden homes. I couldn't breathe and I was choking and sweating. I thought the only release from this agony would be to die. I wondered how I could kill myself. News of the disaster breaks across Japan, but the national government has no effective strategy to help in local disasters. For trapped victims, the best hope of rescue lies with their loved ones. Yukiko's daughter, Kumiko, races to her mother and brother's home, only to find it destroyed. At that point, I thought they were probably dead because I couldn't believe a person could survive under that rubble. Suddenly, Kumiko hears a noise. Her mother's dog. Then she barks again. And when she stops, I can hear a tapping noise. So I called out, mother, mother. And we heard a tapping response. And we realized she was still alive. After two hours of digging, they finally reach Yukiko. She's been buried for 10 hours and her right leg is paralyzed, but she is alive. Finding her mother gives Kumiko new hope. Her younger brother could be alive too. Desperately, they dig to find him before it's too late. Nature's fury moves not only earth, but water with horrifying consequences. When Hurricane Katrina scores a direct hit on America's Gulf Coast in 2005, the area was forewarned, but woefully unprepared. Terrible winds and hideous waves batter the coast. The sea swallows entire neighborhoods. Beachfront casinos are wiped out. And the human toll would last a generation. But in the sheer scope of the disaster, it was little compared to the deadly time bomb nature unleashed in Asia. The Indian Ocean. On its eastern boundary lies a massive trench at the edge of a vast fault line known as the Sunda Megathrust. On December 26, 2004, deep below the Indian Ocean, the Earth begins to shake. The tremors last a record eight minutes. When the quake ends, people are in shock. Worst hit, the island of Sumatra. It's located nearest the epicenter of the quake. But the horror isn't over. On the shore, a massive wall of water is approaching fast. Within moments, the town of Lochna is swamped. The coast is pounded by a series of killer waves, each bigger than the last. In the provincial capital of Banda Aceh, 170,000 people are swept away by the sea. The ocean penetrates an unbelievable four kilometers inland as captured in this footage by an amateur cameraman. Even here, the water has enough force to carry off everything in its path. In seconds, the water speeds up. No one can outrun it. As chaos unfolds in Sumatra, the tsunami heads east. On the Thai island of Koh Phi Phi, Vacationers watch in horror as the sea swallows a resort. Oh my God, look at the waves coming. Clear out, people! 
while people fight for their lives in the eastern Indian Ocean, the tsunami strikes 2,000 kilometers away in Sri Lanka. Thousands are swept away in an instant. The tsunami continues on its devastating path, finally bringing chaos to the coast of Somalia in Africa, 5,000 kilometers from its first landfall. The waves kill 289 people. All across the Indian Ocean, incredible events are captured on video. The toll on human life is unimaginable. Two hundred and thirty thousand people are killed in over fourteen countries. On Sumatra, the coastline is now unrecognizable and thousands are missing. Parents like Ibu Nalili frantically search for their children. After the water receded, I was confused and frightened. There were so many dead bodies, not only people from this village, but people from other places too. Ibu finds her blind daughter, Fitri, then her son. Together they sift through debris and corpses, searching for Ibu's little nine-year-old daughter, Ichut. But it's a race against time. With each passing minute, their chances of finding Ichut alive dwindle. We've witnessed the terrible power of nature's fury, unleashed in colossal natural disasters on nearly every corner of the globe. The result, unimaginable human suffering. Now we can reveal what happened to trigger those events and why scientists fail to warn people of the impending catastrophes. Montserrat's volcano has just erupted in a deadly tsunami of red-hot rock and ash. Farmers are directly in the path of the lava flow. Hurry up! Delia Pond and her family make a narrow escape. Looking back, they see the fields they were just working in are engulfed. You're looking into Armageddon because you cannot see anything. Everything is just, just clouds, just clouds and smoke. Others who try to get away on foot pray they'll make it to safety. But they can't outrun the volcano's pyroclastic surge as it races down the mountain at hurricane speeds. It's so violent that rocks burst apart releasing superheated gases that ride over the lava flow like a white-hot cloud, incinerating everything in their path. The island reels in shock. In this tiny country where everyone knows everyone, it's a day they'll never forget. In just 25 minutes, 19 islanders are dead. Four square kilometers of land are covered with lava and ash. It's a wasteland. Despite this tragedy, what's truly remarkable is that more didn't die. There is a silver lining to the catastrophe. One month later, after the islanders are evacuated, Sufria Hills blasts the big one. Had the volcano erupted this violently a month earlier, it could have killed thousands. Sufria Hills is still a very active volcano. It erupted again in February 2010. Sadly, half of this once stunning island nation remains uninhabitable. 
Two hours after a mega avalanche hits the village of Galtur in the Austrian Alps, there's little hope of finding anyone alive. Against all odds, a search dog picks up a scent near a buried car. The rescue team digs frantically. They're three meters down when they spot the body of German tourist Christa Kapelna. Christa and her husband Helmut were walking back to their lodge in the safe zone when they were swept away by a killer wall of snow. After nearly three hours, she's barely alive. Rescuers work through the night in search of more survivors. But no one else is found alive, including Krista's husband. In the following days, the entire village is evacuated. As Krista recovers from her ordeal, her thoughts turn to her husband. After a while, it dawned on me what must have happened. I had worked it out for myself by then. If he'd not been found yet, he simply could not have survived. The rescue team finds Helmut's body, just 50 meters from the spot where they rescued Krista. He's one of 31 victims who die in Galtor. The Galtor avalanche of 1999 turned out to be the worst alpine avalanche in 40 years. Experts are shocked at the devastation and to find that most of the people killed were in the heart of the safe zone. It means their computer model dividing Galtor into three hazard zones was a complete failure. What's more, the same model is used throughout the Alps leaving thousands of people at risk. It's obvious this was no ordinary avalanche. It left the safe zone looking like a war zone. Even the massive snowfall and high winds couldn't have caused this destruction. An investigation finds that wild temperature changes earlier in winter allowed one layer of snow to become freakishly strong. Instead of breaking off, it allowed massive amounts of snow to build up on the mountaintop. Until February 23rd, the day of the avalanche. A giant snow slab, estimated to weigh the equivalent of 428 fully laden jumbo jets, breaks away from the mountain. Galtor lies directly in its path. As the avalanche thunders down the mountain, it picks up more snow, increasing in size by an estimated 20,000 tons. Now, the wall of snow becomes a more complex avalanche. It's packing two layers of snow. The bottom, heavier layer, hits the buildings on the outskirts of the village with a tremendous force. Then the lighter powder layer races into the supposedly safe green zone at 417 kilometers per hour. A speed as fast as the fastest race car ever built. The final mystery is solved. Galtor's hazard zones were set up on the classic avalanche model. But the town was hit by a freakish two layer powder avalanche. Austria immediately built new defenses to protect their villages from all types of avalanches. Barrier walls surround the villages, and high up on the mountain ridge, fencing prevents the buildup of large slabs of snow. The hard lessons learned at Galtor improved avalanche prediction throughout the world, and helped to ensure that people in the mountains are now safer than ever before. On April 3rd, 1974, 148 tornadoes ripped through Tornado Alley in what became known as the Super Outbreak. Six of them are thought to be F5s, the most powerful twisters. 
As day breaks on April 4th, the scale of the devastation is shocking. Five and a half thousand people are injured. 330 are dead, including Karen Stott's friends, who drowned in the Tippecanoe River. The Weather Service's inability to accurately predict tornado strikes results in tragedy. But the outbreak changes tornado forecasting forever. Dr. Ted Fujita from the University of Chicago is convinced that an investigation into the super outbreak could save lives in the future. He reveals a radical plan. Even at that time, Dr. Fujita had the reputation of being Mr. Tornado. If there was any one person that you looked to for studying tornadoes, Dr. Fujita was it. Fujita is the expert's expert. He developed the Fujita, or F scale, which is still used to classify the strength of tornadoes today. Fujita plans to match aerial photographs with radar images taken during the outbreak. He believes this will help predict where and when tornadoes will strike in the future. His team also collects evidence on the ground to learn the behavior and timings of each tornado. Fujita's investigation is a scientific milestone. It debunks the dangerous myth that opening windows stops houses from exploding. That advice actually puts lives at risk People waste precious time opening windows when they should be looking for cover. The team also disproves the prevailing theory that some tornadoes miss or skip buildings because they occasionally lift into the air. Instead, rare films of the actual tornadoes prove that rather than lifting, some tornadoes are multi-funneled, with the smaller funnels adding another layer of wind. Rather than one tornado skipping buildings, multiple funnels cause the damage. Most importantly, the team's research into hook echoes provides the key to predicting the most dangerous twisters. Fujita's study of the super outbreak gave meteorologists a much better chance of warning the public in the future. On several levels, the super outbreak went a long way toward eventually reducing casualties from tornadoes. Greg Forbes continues his work as a meteorologist. The high-tech tools in use today are quantum leaps ahead of the grainy radar scans of 1974. Now we have the means to go into a tornado, even vehicles equipped to chase storms. The benefits to the public as a result of these new tools came as a direct consequence of lessons learned from the 1974 super outbreak. In the wake of the 2004 Asian tsunami, countries all around the Indian Ocean try to cope with the destruction. Sumatra is the hardest hit. Here, a mother searches for her missing nine-year-old daughter, Ichut. We look for Ichut everywhere. But after hours of searching, the truth is inescapable. I couldn't find my little one. I haven't seen Ichut to this day. Like so many youngsters, Ichut wasn't strong enough to survive the force of the water. More than one third of the tsunami's victims are children. It's the most devastating tsunami in recorded history. Entire communities are wiped out. Sumatra alone loses around 170,000 people. In total, more than 270,000 people are killed. But the true death toll will never be known. 
Before 2004, scientists knew the fault line off Sumatra was a risk for a giant earthquake. But when the big one blew, it happened much further north, and the underwater rupture traveled 1,600 kilometers, the largest ever recorded. The quake lasted an unprecedented eight minutes and released so much energy, it was off the Richter scale. And when the quake lifts the seafloor, it displaces billions of tons of liquid, causing a wall of water to move away on either side. The surprise location of the December quake means that every undersea fault is now considered a tsunami threat. It's a wake-up call for tsunami experts like Professor Costas Sinolakis, whose California home on the west coast of the United States is at risk. He wants to be prepared and warn of an impending disaster. Our work is very much like the FBI profiling a serial killer. We have to very, very carefully look at the clues then we can maybe point our finger and say, this is where the killer came from, and this is what he can do again. Sinolakis is an expert in modeling tsunamis. He tries to predict what would happen to coastal communities if they were hit by a killer wave, and advises where to locate public buildings, like hospitals, to avoid being swamped in an emergency. The Asian tsunami illustrates the need for this research. Tsunamis, they're inevitable. It's just a question of time. The final question raised by the Asian catastrophe is whether anything can be done to alert people to an approaching tsunami. Increasingly sophisticated warning systems are in place across the world, capable of detecting killer waves on the ocean but even such high-tech systems can't always be perfect. For 60% of the victims of the Asian tsunami, no alert would have helped. The coast of Sumatra is too close to the source of the waves for a warning to have had any effect. There was just no time to react. When Kobe, Japan is hit with a monster earthquake, the city seems horribly unprepared. Emergency services are overwhelmed by the scale of the disaster. Against all odds, Kumiko Shono finds her mother alive in her shattered home. Hours later, she finds her brother, but it's too late. When they checked my brother's pulse, they told me he didn't make it. It was the most shocking thing that's ever happened to me. Kumiko must tell her mother that her beloved son is dead. So my daughter told me that Satoshi didn't make it, and I couldn't speak. I just said, I see. I cried underneath my quilt after she left, making sure that my tears couldn't be seen from the outside. Yukiko's son is just one of 5,502 people killed. The city of Kobe is devastated. Over 200,000 people are homeless. More than 100,000 buildings destroyed. Now, people want answers. Earthquakes are a fact of life in Japan, and people thought they were prepared. In the aftermath of the Kobe earthquake, Experts are stunned at the level of devastation. It could only be caused by a fault rupturing directly under the city. But the earthquake started 15 kilometers away on Awaji Island. 
experts discover a previously unknown underwater fault line that links the Awaji Fault to one directly under Kobe. So the small quakes recorded the day before weren't just harmless tremors. They were signs that the ground was shifting along the fault line. Scientists now know what happened. The magnitude of the Awaji earthquake triggers a chain reaction through the undiscovered fault. The quake races along this fault towards Kobe at 9,000 kilometers per hour. Six seconds later, the fault under the city ruptures. It blows with the energy of a 65 kiloton nuclear bomb, a force that wipes out Kobe's traditional neighborhoods where most of the deaths occurred. A closer look reveals that these homes have very lightweight structures and very heavy roofs. When the ground moved, the houses simply collapsed. It's the construction of the traditional Japanese house that kills nine out of 10 people in the earthquake. But the city's modern elevated roadway was built to withstand earthquakes. Supported by hundreds of concrete pillars, it shouldn't have collapsed. It turns out that the epicenter of the quake was unusually shallow, just 15 kilometers below the surface. The ground moved so violently, it unseated pillars holding up the roadway. Some snapped like twigs, causing an entire section to collapse. In the wake of the disaster, city authorities rebuild Kobe using the latest earthquake proofing technology. Modern houses with solid walls and light roofs replace the flattened traditional neighborhoods. And the elevated expressways get a $3 billion upgrade. Bus driver Yoshio Fukumoto made a lucky escape from the expressway collapse. But his fear may last a lifetime. When I see earthquakes today, I feel a raw pain. I'm very frightened of earthquakes. Yukiko Shono still lives in Kobe, in the house where her son Satoshi died. Now she speaks on how to be prepared when an earthquake strikes. If that saves even one more life, the next disaster, this is the least I can do for those who died. If there is a world beyond this one, when I get to where my son is, I can at least smile and proudly tell him, Mummy has done well. The lessons learned from Kobe did save others, less than a decade later. When a quake hit the city of Nagata in 2004, Special rescue teams were on the scene within hours. Japan is a modern country and more prepared than ever before. But poor countries like Haiti don't have the resources to prepare for disaster. And even when forewarned about Hurricane Katrina, the United States, one of the world's richest nations, was completely unprepared. Despite all we know, predicting nature's time bombs is far from an exact science. Earth is a living planet, ever-changing in both awesome and terrifying ways.